Please join me in welcoming Father Greg Boyle. Thank you very much. I thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you, Darius, for your eloquence. Thank you, Frankie, I, uh, for your friendship and your music. Thank you for being here, and thank you for turning your clocks back I, uh, so you're all on time. Uh, thank you for mentioning my third book, which just came out. Um, you know, my fear was that it would be, you know, Godfather 3, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I just don't want it to suck, um, you know, like Godfather 3. And, um, you know, I, I was on the plane uh, with uh, Saul and uh, Brandon, and I was returning to my seat from uh, the restroom, and I was walking, and there was a guy sitting on the aisle and his tray table was down and a book was open and I could see the distinctive color of my third book, uh, which is kind of turquoise. And I looked, I said, oh my God, he's reading my book, you know, and, and I looked at him and he was <laughs> totally <laughs> knocked out, you know, drooling babas. It was, uh, so I'm happy to address insomnia in our country. You know, Homie said that uh, you, you should always uh, begin your talks with self-defecating humor. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no shit, that's... Uh... <laughs> and, and talking about my book that way which sort of is self-defecating. So, um... so what are we to do? You know, I mean, I, I, we want God's dream come true, which is, as Jesus says, that you may be one, but there is no us and them, it's just us. And uh, connection and communion, and this is all that God longs for. And so, uh, of course, we're, we're created in the image and likeness of God, but Richard Rohr says that our image of God creates us, which is equally true. So uh, that's why we want to refine and get to know this God who loves us without measure and without regret, this God who can't take her eyes off of us, this God who longs uh, to just cherish us, this God who protects us from nothing and sustains us in everything. We wanna be in the world who this God is, loving, kind, and compassionate. And that's why we gather here. You know, uh, I'm proud of, uh, you know, that this is an Ignatian thing because uh, we want to recognize the keen insights of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And, um, and I'll, I'm inching towards uh, next year, 50 years as a Jesuit. And we have three Jesuits uh, who work at Homeboy Industries. And, and the truth be told, the homies don't know that much, you know, uh, like who Jesuits are, you know, and uh, I was uh, sitting in my office and it's glass enclosed and a homie uh, named Adrian was, was walking a huge tour group in front of my office. And uh, we have thousands of tours from all over the world and people come through and homies take them through and show them everything and tattoo removal and the bakery and um, and tell their stories while they do it. So Adrian has this group of like 15 people parked right in front of my office and I'm, I see them and hi, and, and it's like, observe our founder in his natural habitat, you know, and, <laughs> and I'm talking to these people there and he's got a loud ass voice, you know, and so he's uh, saying, this is Father Greg Boyle. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries. He, is a jujitsu priest. <laughs> so I kind of gave him some of my, my better moves. You know, we're about kinship, we're about connection. There's an end goal to our standing at the margins so that the margins erase. The idea is God is inclusion. And so we want to expand 
this circle of compassion so that no one is standing outside the circle. It's about connection and union, no us and them. It's about obliterating the illusion that we are separate. As Darius said so eloquently, we're, we're human beings, which is to say we all share the last name, same last name, beings. We're all born into the world wanting the same things. So how do we find our connection with each other, which is the only thing God wants. It's the only adoration that God has any interest in. And you know, the homies aren't here right now. They're, they're out uh, seeing the sights and they were going to the Holocaust Museum. And, and I've uh, encouraged homies and homegirls that I've brought to DC to go do that. It's kind of a life-changing experience if you've never been. And, I went a number of years ago and, uh, with Lewis and Joe, big, huge gang members, and, um, and you know, they, I said, go, go see the museum. And I, I was in the lobby waiting for them after they were done. They did like four hours in the museum. When they came down, they were blown away. And uh, they were debriefing about the experience. And, and then we looked over there and we saw this man in his 80s who was sitting behind a desk. and. It, he had a kind of a name plate and it said Holocaust survivor. And there was a chair in front of the desk as if to invite you to sit in it. And we see this and, and Joe says, gosh, you know, what, what would we say to somebody who had suffered so much? And, and Lewis, because he was fearless, he says, well, I'm gonna go talk to him. And we said, good, we'll, we'll be in the bookstore, you know? And, and so he told us about it later. The man's name was Jacob, and he had been in Auschwitz as an early teenager, and both parents were killed there. He watched his sisters gunned down right before his eyes, and because he was young, he was a worker, and he survived the experience. And Lewis listened to him. After uh, he spoke and told his story, Lewis pulled out his card, and he says, uh, I work at Homeboy Industries, its largest gang intervention rehab reentry program in the world. I hope that if you're ever near LA, you'll come by and visit. And Jacob studied the card. And Lewis says to him, I'm 35 years old. Half of my life I've spent locked up. And, and Jacob kind of mock, you know, scoffs a little bit. He says, oh, American prisons, you know. You got your own room, you have your own bed, you have a mattress, you have a pillow. We slept on wooden planks. And if you said one word in line, they'd pull you out of line and beat you nearly half to death. And Lewis listens to him. And then Lewis says, yeah, you know, once I was beaten so badly at county jail that that I looked like the elephant man and they stripped me naked and threw me in a cell and I had to sleep on a metal sheet. I said, well, Lewis, um, let me see if I got this right. I'm, you were comparing your experience and suffering with a Holocaust survivor? And he was clear-eyed and his vo voice was kind of soaked with the gospel and he looked at me and he said, no, I wasn't comparing. I wasn't competing with him. And then his eyes welled up with tears and it was hard to get out this last part. I was connecting with him, which is the hope. Wallace Stevens, the poet says, we live in the description of the place but not the place itself. We need to move beyond settling for the partial God and hold out for the, the one we actually have. We need to no longer settle for the description of the place, but hold out for the place itself. We need to not just settle for pointing things out, but to pointing the way. We need not to settle for shaking our fists and instead hold out for rolling up our sleeves. The place itself. 
I was uh, praying the other day and reflecting on Jesus and the Gerasene demoniacs, and there are like three versions in the Gospels, and one of them, you know, this is the guy who's kind of on the road and he's naked and people don't want to walk down that road because he's kind of wackadoodle and you don't want to get near him and he's violent and unpredictable. And, and in this one version, Jesus looks at him and he says, what is your name? And the guy says, I am Legion, which I guess means I'm a lot. There are a lot of me. But I read a translation the other day that said, instead of I am legion, I am what I'm afflicted with. And pretty soon he's clothed and sitting at Jesus' feet. And he's listening to him, he's following him. Because the man is not what he is afflicted with. He discovers his true self in loving. He is cherished in the asking of his name and he thrives because of it. We're not just supposed to point things out, we're supposed to point the way. And love never fails. Everyone believes in a God of second chances though our society offers very few of them. Everyone believes in the infinite mercy of our God, but we can be quite stingy. Everybody believes in a God who includes everyone. But we ostracize and we cut off and we say, you don't belong to us. And yet the truth that God, who loves us without measure and without regret, tells us is that everyone is unshakably good and we belong to each other. And we need to ask each other's name. And as Darius said, see each other. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are, the Buddhists say. We need to see each other. Once I was invited to speak at a uh, on a radio call-in show, and it was all in Spanish for one hour. And it was early in the morning, and I, I drove over to West Covina or wherever it was, and I'm doing this Q&A with these two uh, broadcasters, all in Spanish, and every once in a while they'd take a phone call from, uh, you know, somebody, and they'd say, uh, you know, Maria de Compton tiene una pregunta, and, and, and mostly they were mothers asking me questions about what do I do with my son who's a gang member or wandering perilously close to gangs. And so I did the best I could. And it was one hour in Spanish, back and forth. And then they finally had one last caller. Tenemos una llamada de Filiberto de Downey. Well, Filiberto, I go, well, that's not a name you hear every day. And we have a worker at Homeboy named Fili. Filiberto, we call him Fili. And so the call comes in over the loudspeaker and says, hey, G, it's me, Fili. Yeah, I'm not feeling that good this morning, so I'm just calling to tell you I won't be coming to work. <laughs> so Fili chose a radio call-in show to call and work. I said, okay, Phil, gotcha. I hope you feel better. Philly is in a wheelchair and because he was shot and paralyzed and uh, in, because of gang violence. And he wheels one day into my office. And out of the blue, he just says, hey, you know, I found this flika the other day, a photograph. I said, yeah. Yeah, it's a picture of me. I think I'm like nine. It's a little black and white. I think my parents, it was for the migra or something. I don't know, for an ID. I just keep looking at that picture. I can't believe it's me. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Two days later, he wheeled himself into my office. He said, you know, I, I still, I can't get over looking at that picture. I can't believe it's me. And, and I'm thinking maybe he doesn't remember that he brought this up before. And I said, oh yeah, you know, you mentioned that. That's interesting. It was kind of odd, out of the wild blue yonder. And then a couple days later, he wheels himself in and he flicks the flika on my desk. And there he is, this little, nine-year-old unsmiling Filiberto. 
and he's got a huge shock of hair and, and presently sitting in his wheelchair in front of me, he's all clean shaven as homies do. And, and I don't know what to say and I go, damn, Philly, you have hair. You know, I don't know what to say. And I don't know if he's giving me the picture and, and the only way to determine that is to offer to give it back. And, and so I extend it to him and he says, do you think there's any way we can make it big? I said, well, sure. So at the end of the day, I went to the Montebello Town Center and I walk into the camera store and the guy comes up to me and he says, can I help you? I said, make it big. <laughs> and he said, you know, I think it's too small to enlarge. And I said, I don't know what you're going to do, but you have to make this photograph bigger than it is. And then he kind of worked his magic and he brought it back to me and it was kind of uh, way bigger and it was kind of green and a little bit grainy. And this is not a story about a photograph. It's a story about the self made to feel too small from having been bombarded with messages and shame and disgrace. The Gerasene demoniac identifying himself as I am what I'm afflicted with. And it is our task to put ourselves at the margins to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away and to stand at the margins because they'll never get erased otherwise. To put ourselves in proximity so that we can stand with the easily despised and readily left out and those who think they are what they are afflicted with. Jesus uh, says, who do you say that I am? But what he's really saying is, how do you say it? If we just point things out, we're not pointing the way. How do you say it? Again, one uh, morning I was in my office and, and the reception area was packed with gang members trying to get into our 18-month training program. And, and there's the well, if any of you have been at Homeboy, and there's homies and homegirls who are there and checking people in. People are there to get tattoos removed and see job developers and have a therapy session. And it's packed. And I'm talking to some donors, but I can look over their heads and I can see that a guy has come in, a homie, I don't know him, but he's a gang member, and there's a look of alarm on the faces of the three, uh, two homies and a homegirl, and they're looking at him, and they're alarmed, and the reason is he has a soda can, and with every uh, punctuation mark, he's, he's it's a big glop of sodas flopping onto the counter, you know, a punctuation mark here, a period, an exclamation. And I look at it and I diagnose it kind of immediately as meth and madness. So I think, oh shoot, I'm gonna to have to get up and deal with them. But before I can even leave my office, I can see that Miguel Lugo has shown up and, and uh, he's the head of security. He's a homie who was in prison for 25 years, half of that time in the shoe, in, the, in solitary. The day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than Miguel Lugo. And he's a big, huge guy and he's uh, wearing a shirt and it says security on the back. And I can see he puts his arm gently around this guy, his shoulder, and walks him outside. We have kind of a policy, get folks outside because people are so easily triggered inside. And so he has him outside and he's telling me about this later. He looks at the guy and he says, hey, how about you and me, we walk down to Alvera Street and I'll buy you some tacos. And the guy looks at Miguel, steely eyed, and he lifts up his shirt, revealing a gun tucked into the front of his pants. He says, how about I put a bullet in your head and he drops his shirt. And Miguel looks at him and he says, Two tacos or three. And the two of them walked down to Olvera Street, two blocks away from us, and 
And he says, the guy is uh, having a conversation with the voices in his head, but the voices leap out like a bunch of frogs, he says. And he's having this conversation. Don't trust his ass. He's okay. No, shoot him. No, he's buying me tacos like that, back and forth. Then they get to Alvera Street, and he buys them three tacos. And the guy takes one taco, and he throws it to the ground. And he devours the other two because he's hungry. And we all share the same last name being and we were all born wanting the same things, and everyone is unshakably good, and everyone belongs to us, and so our task in pointing the way is to repair severed belonging. Our covenantal relationship reminds us in, in this gospel you, uh, today at Mass and in the first reading, you'll hear about the widow. And the covenant says from God, as I have loved you, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and stranger. And God isolates these people as the folks who know what it's like to have been cut off and because they have suffered in exactly this way, God thinks these are the folks who will guide the rest of us to the kinship of God because they are trustworthy. And so we stand with them and we allow our hearts to be reached and altered because we do. And trust me, the world will accuse you of wasting your time at the margins. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. What Miguel Lugo knew about this guy was that there's a thorn underneath. The homies always say, find the thorn underneath. That's the mystical way of seeing. It's not about morality because morality has never kept us moral. It's only kept us from each other. It's about taking seriously what Jesus took seriously. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. We're meant to kind of get underneath and see as mystics do. My friend Mirabai Starr, who's a mystic and writes about mysticism, says that once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods. The moral one, the one who talks about right and wrong and good and evil, I've never met an evil person in my life. And I worked with gang members for almost 40 years. I've met damaged people, traumatized people, despondent people, mentally ill people, people on PCP and meth. Never met a bad person. Find me a mystic who thinks there's a hell and I think you will have located somebody who's not a mystic. I want to see as Miguel Lugo does with the meth madness guy. John Lewis, uh, the great John Lewis said, we all live in the same house. He doesn't qualify it and say some live on the third floor and some in the basement. He doesn't use it as some aspirational statement. One day we might all live in the same house. He says it straight out. We all live in the same house. The place itself, that's what we're meant to imagine and to make real. Don't get stuck in moral outrage. Hold out for moral compass that sees as a mystic does, that sees the thorn underneath. I was in Sacramento, um, actually about to go to Jesuit High. Is Jesuit High somewhere here? Oh, there you are. Good job yesterday, you guys. 
And I uh, had two homies with me, and, uh, and so we got in late. It was a Sunday night, and because I had kind of a later mass and, and later than I wanted to arrive, and we were uh, Rob and Chamuco, we called him Chamuco and myself, were waiting for the, the bus that takes us to the rental car center. And, and we get on the bus, and Rob and I sit kind of towards the back, uh, facing each other. But Chamuco sits at the very end. And Chamuco, we call him Chamuco because it's an affectionate name for the devil, because he has very pronounced dark devil's horns tattooed on his forehead, along with some other things, a lot of ink. And he sits in the back, and I watch people get on the bus, and I watch them avoid sitting next to Chamuco. And they do this, they get near, and they see his big ass devil's horns, and they do this foxtrot not to sit next to him. And, and then finally, uh, there are only two sets, seats left, and they're on either side of him. And so they have to sit there, and they're not one bit happy about it. And, and so we drive in this wooded, dark, secluded area from the terminal to the car rental place. And somewhere right in the middle, the, the bus shuts down. It's an electric bus. And we can hear the woman, the driver, she's turning the keys. I'm sorry, give me a minute. And, and everybody's silent for some time. And, and it was odd that nobody was speaking. And then out of the silence from the back of the bus in this secluded, dark, wooded area is Chamuco. And he says, I saw this in a movie once. <laughs> it does not end well. Well, every damn buddy just died laughing, as the homies say at Homeboy Industries, we laughed from the stomach. Brought to you, kinship, union, connection, by the guy with the devil's horns. This was some years ago, after the election of 2016. My guess is that half the people on the bus voted one way in that presidential election and half voted another way. But there we all were, laughing from the stomach. Kinship, a connection that God might recognize. A homie texted me during the pandemic. He had somehow wandered onto some uh, YouTube video of a bishop who was talking about sin and how we needed to have a contrite heart. And, he was uh, kind of worked up about it and felt terrible and how sinful he was. And I, I wrote him back. I said, God doesn't see sin. God sees son. And God doesn't have enemies. There is no us and them. It's just us. And we're meant to go from this place to create such union. People always ask me about enemies uh, working together, and decidedly it's tense initially. And homies will say, you know, I, I want a job and I want to work at Homeboy. I say, well, okay, how about in the bakery? I have an opening, but you got to work with X, Y, and Z, and I rattle off the names of rivals, enemies. And they always say the same thing. I'll work with them, but I'm not going to talk to them, which used to bother me until you understand that we're all human beings sharing the same last name and humans can't sustain this. You can't demonize someone you know. So I had a homie named Youngster who was uh, 19, and I thought he was ready. And uh, so he wanted to hang up his gloves and, and no longer gangbang. He wanted to transform his pain so he, he didn't transmit it anymore. And so I bring him over to our homeboy silkscreen factory, which has been around for almost 27 years. Thousands of gang members have worked there over the years. So I bring Youngster in, and I introduce him to all his coworkers, and I watch him shake hands with each worker. Many, many of them are enemies. There's like 30 of them. And he's making eye contact, firm handshake. I'm thinking, wow, this is great. And then he gets to the very last guy, a guy named Puppet, who seemed to be trying to avoid this encounter altogether. And when Puppet and Youngster are in each other's vicinity, they mumble something. They stare at their shoes. They won't shake hands. 
Well, I know that they're enemies because I know what gangs they're from, but he just shook hands with a whole bunch of enemies. So I find out later that this is a beef that's quite personal, a hatred beyond which neither of them thought they could get past. So I sensed that at the moment I looked at him. I said, hey, uh, if you guys can't hang working with each other, let me know. I got a gang of vatos who want this job. Calladitos, they don't say a word. Well, six months later, uh, Puppet is walking to a corner store some distance from his home, and he purchases something. And as he's walking home, for some reason, he takes a shortcut, and he dodges into an alley. And suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one, and they beat him badly. He lands on the ground, and they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep him connected to machines for 48 hours so you can get a clean, flat line read so the doctors can declare him dead. I was at St. Louis University giving a talk. I flew home immediately. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the second day, I anointed his forehead with oil. I said a blessing prayer, and we disconnected. And I buried him a week later. But in the first 24 hours, as he was still connected to the machine, I was in my office alone. It was 8 o'clock at night, and the phone rings. And it's youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. Hey, he says, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it. But he's the one to break the silence, and he says, choking back his tears with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens? Yeah, of course it does. Any exceptions? No. Separation is an illusion. We all happen to share the same last name. We were all born into the world wanting the same things. And we are invited to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. We all live in the same house. Do not settle for the description of the place. Hold out for the place itself. Don't settle for pointing things out. Hold out for pointing the way. Don't settle for just shaking your fist, roll up your sleeves, create the place where we cherish each other with every breath. We are confident in you that you will not care if somebody accuses you of wasting your time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you very much.